This video contains spoilers for Thor Love and Thunder. I am absolutely serious. We worked super hard to get you a Thor Love and Thunder theory up as soon as possible because we knew that this one was going to leave you with some big questions and we wanted to get you some big answers to those big questions. But to do that, we got to cover some big spoilers. So y'all ready? Great. Let's go. Hello, Internet! Welcome to Film Theory, the show that hopes your mule near that screen so you can hammer the subscribe button. Last time we covered Thor Love and Thunder, we predicted that the trailer's use of the song Sweet Child of Mine was a big clue that the whole movie was gonna boil down to a plot point that hadn't yet been revealed. A secret baby. And it turns out we were right on the money. Well, Maybe, maybe not on the money, maybe slightly adjacent to the money. You see, the big bad of this movie is Gore, a regular non-superpowered alien guy who's got himself a big old vendetta against the gods. Why would he have that, you may ask? Well, shortly after having to watch his young daughter tragically die from dehydration on their desert planet, he happened to encounter one of the actual superhuman beings that his species worshipped as their gods. And, uh, what is it they always say? Don't meet your heroes? Yeah, Gore learned the hard way that a lot of these guys kinda suck, and that all the praying that he and his daughter did for her survival was nothing. Their life of hardship, utterly meaningless. But now that Gore has found himself a magic sword that can kill the gods, he plans to do exactly that. For a little bit, at least. He realizes that this sort of mission would take kind of a long time, you know? Bumping off gods, one by one. Not exactly the scalable solution that Gore here was looking for. So instead, he has himself a scheme to get the job done all at once Thanos-style. He plans to find the cosmic being Eternity and wish all the gods away because apparently the center of the universe just grants wishes now. Gotta admit, things are starting to feel a lot like a Dragon Ball arc. The only thing missing are some androids. Oh well, yeah, I, I, I guess they got them too. Side note, is it just me or does it feel like there are way too many instant genocide buttons here in this universe? Anyway, because they gotta wrap this thing up in one movie, Jane sacrifices herself during the final battle, and the love between her and Thor is enough to change Gore's mind. Instead of wishing everyone else dead, he chooses to wish for his daughter to come back to life. But uh, because he was mortally wounded during the battle, Thor swears that he's gonna protect the child himself, which I'm now realizing is meant to be a thematic rhyme with Odin adopting the abandoned baby Loki on the battlefield, which therefore brings Thor's inheritance arc back around for good, and it's it's really smartly done, okay? Also, my recording booth just really smells like onions. <clears throat> so, like I said, right about a child being pivotal to the story, wrong about who? But uh, then again, there was really no way to call this one based on deep comic lore, because Gore's daughter? Yeah, totally new thing. Gore didn't have a daughter. Thor doesn't traditionally have a daughter. There isn't some popular alt character that she'd easily map onto. This is a completely new, unpredictable angle. So good on you, Taika Waititi. Way to be one of the only people in Hollywood to have original ideas. The only other main context we've got, at least for now, is that her name is apparently Love. She's described as being a child born of eternity. She has superhuman powers of her own, and she can wield Stormbreaker. So my main theory today is asking the question, what does all of this mean? Well, I'll tell you one thing it means right off the bat. It means that Chris Hemsworth's been giving away this twist for weeks and nobody could tell. That's my daughter as well. She plays the character of love. It also means that the real love story in this movie was Disney's love of recycling the crusty old guy takes care of the cute young thing plot. I mean, hey, if it worked for Mandalorian, it'll apparently work for everything else. Literally everything else. But seriously, you know what I love to do after one of these movies. Look at where all the pieces have landed on the table and try to predict what Disney's next move might be. And between the introduction of not just one, but two superpowered beings in Hercules and love, there's certainly a lot of story potential here. So what's it all mean? That, my friends, is what I aim to explore today. First, let's talk a little bit more about Hercules. We meet our first new powerhouse thanks to the god-filled Omnipotent City, which was basically a whole sequence screaming, please go frame by frame through me. The heroes even make sure to wave to an off-screen god of carpentry. I see what you guys did there. Knowing how rationally the internet tends to respond to the media they consume, I'm sure none of that's gonna cause any angry headlines. On the plus side, I guess it means that Ghost Rider will be getting his reboot soon rather than later. But apart from being fodder for like a million clickbait thumbnails with red arrows and circles, the other reason for visiting Omnipotent City was to set up a post credit scene that introduces the demigod that lots of fans have been asking about for ages. In that post credit scene, an angry Zeus is embarrassed that Thor and company bested him earlier in the movie. And so Zeus sends his son Hercules to go in and please beat up Thor in a sequel. Now obviously they're just setting him up as a nemesis for Thor 5, or potentially a morally questionable anti-Thor, thereby making him a prime candidate for the 
Thunderbolts movie that they just announced, where everyone gets their own version of a Dark Avenger. But there is one completely bonkers thing that they might have planned for him that would literally break the internet. Let me explain. I assume we all just kind of know who Hercules is, right? Thanks to everyone from Disney to The Rock taking their own stab at him. He's a hero from Greek mythology, half-human child of Zeus known for big muscles, completing 12 labors, and sometimes wearing a cool hat that's made out of a lion. Well, the Marvel version is, uh, that. Pretty much the exact same guy from the myths. Basically how Thor shares a lot of similarities with the mythical Norse Thor. And when it comes to the comics, Herc is kind of a fan-favorite second stringer, largely because he was one of the earliest examples of Stan Lee and company creating a playfully meta-take on real-world pop culture. See, in the 1950s and 60s, the genre of sword and sandal movies were all the rage because of their low budgets and shockingly high returns. All a cheap producer had to do was hire some Mediterranean bodybuilders to fight in skimpy togas in front of old Greco-Roman ruins, and then just watch as the cash flowed in. Kids loved the mythical action-adventure, and the moms bringing them to the theaters loved the view, so to speak. The most famous actor to come out of these was Steve Reeves, who starred in a whole series of the Sword and Sandal films through the late 50s and 60s. His most iconic role was Hercules, and looking at that iteration of the hero compared to Marvel's version, the inspiration there is pretty obvious. Since then, Herc's been an active character, a fixture on a lot of different teams in the Marvel Universe, and an on-again, off-again frenemy to both Thor and the Hulk. But how does any of this apply to the MCU and Herc's place in it moving forward? Well, despite being set up as an obvious foil for Thor in the next outing, he might appear sooner than that. I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if he somehow shows up in She-Hulk, because well, that's been a thing before. He could also make an appearance with the Young Avengers, of all places, considering in the comics he's currently in a relationship with the Young Avenger Marvel Boy, and he has a history of teaching younger heroes. But here is my wild swing for the fences theory. This one is pretty crazy, but stick with me on it. Did you know that the live action Aladdin was actually in the process of getting a sequel? Yeah, I was surprised too. Anyway, the director Guy Ritchie recently stepped away from that project. I can't really imagine why. <laughs> oh, wow! So, as expected, he moved on to something new. It kind of got overlooked with so many other exciting announcements that Disney's made recently, but he's now doing a live action remake for Disney's Hercules. Makes sense, going from one classic Disney musical remake to another. But here's the part that really caught my attention. This remake is being produced by the Russo Brothers, the brilliant directing duo that gave us Infinity War and Endgame. That's a bit of a weird pivot, don't you think? Superhero guys whose directing and production work have only ever really centered around action stuff suddenly working on a Disney live-action musical remake? Disney would also suddenly have two live-action Hercs running around, which, I mean, that, that alone would just confuse people. What if this is the moment that the traditional Disney movie movie musical crosses over into the MCU, a live-action singing-dancing Hercules in his own adventure who also moonlights alongside the Guardians of the Galaxy and the Warriors of Asgard, all played by the same guy. A guy, mind you, who has himself a great singing voice and a self-professed love of the Muppets. Oh, I mean, it'd be pretty darn crazy, but then again, three generations of Spider-Man just got together in the same movie, so at this point, anything is possible. And I do mean anything. craziest crossover since Endgame, a Kingdom Hearts movie. I mean, that's what happened last time Disney musicals started to cross over with their other IP. I'm only saying, when you hear Sora say, on your left seven years from now, just remember who called it. <laughs> who am I kidding? I just want to put this into live action. Say, fellas, did somebody mention the door to darkness? But while I was busy walking out of the theater dreaming of seeing Edgelord Mickey on the big screen, to everyone else leaving that theater, the true star of the show was love. And to me, the theory potential for a brand new character like this is infinite. To state the obvious, she's a resurrected dead person, and an adopted commoner being raised by a noble. I mean, that makes her symbolically loaded even before the movie explicitly calls her the child born of eternity and gives her cosmic powers. Really, she acts as a merger of two of Phase 4's dominant story threads. Big cosmic existential questions on the nature of faith in the universe, and young heroes inheriting complicated legacies. But just because love is a new character created for the movies doesn't mean that we can't necessarily look at the comics to find some similarities. Cause believe you me, there is plenty to see here. Enough that we can pretty confidently chart where love is gonna be headed as a character. See, cosmically powered kid is a story trope that Marvel Comics has leaned on a lot, especially recently. Plus, Marvel's been using its comics publishing arm as a sort of test kitchen for MCU storylines for the last 15 years or so, which makes these stories definitely worth looking at when you're 
you're trying to predict what's coming down the pipe. In particular, there are two that seem to really match up to where Thor and Love are at the end of this new movie. The first is the creatively titled Civil War 2, where we see a team led by Iron Man and another team led by Captain Marvel at each other's throats over Ulysses Kane, an inhuman teenager with the ability to see the future. There's a lot of disagreement over whether or not to use Ulysses' power to stop crime before it happens, uh, basically the plot of Moon Knight. Throughout the conflict, Ulysses' power continues to grow stronger until Eternity himself intervenes, offering Ulysses a place to stay amongst the cosmic pantheon. One could say that Ulysses' power made him a, quote, child of eternity, just like how love seems to have the potential to achieve cosmic god levels of power in her adulthood. Put a pin in that one, we're gonna come back to it later. The second story I think we should look at is actually one that's currently ongoing in the main Avengers comic book. It involves a powerful cosmic force called the Starbrand. This is a magical tattoo that sears itself into a host, granting that person nearly infinite power limited only by their imagination. But here's the thing. Though the Starbrand concept has existed in Marvel lore since the mid-1980s, it's always been in unimportant alternate universes. But then, all of a sudden, it was introduced into the main 616 continuity in 2013, in an Avengers storyline called The Last White Event. This was done as a self-defense mechanism for the multiverse, with these white events zapping random Earths and granting them star brands in an attempt to stop universes colliding and destroying one another in events called incursions. Now, where have I heard that word before? The larger the footprint you leave behind, the greater the risk of an incursion. Yep, this is one of those storylines that the MCU is currently using to blueprint the movies. It's not stopping there. The star brand has since changed hands several times, and in the Avengers comics coming out right now, it has ended up in the possession of an orphaned girl named Brandy. A girl who, wouldn't you know, is adopted by the Avengers, including Thor. And if that wasn't clear enough, star brands are granted to the user through lightning bolts. Very thematic for a new character introduced in a Thor movie, huh? But the real cherry on top of this evidence Sunday, this Avengers storyline and the girl with the star brand are both creations of writer Jason Aaron. Same guy who created Gore, same guy who created Jane Foster's Mighty Thor, and the same guy who created the dead celestial that the Avengers are currently using as their base. This guy's fingerprints are all over the MCU right now. The way I see it, the most exciting option may just be a fusion of both of these stories. Love gets a star brand, or perhaps she'll be revealed to be the star brand. Either way, this child of eternity has near infinite cosmic power, which catches the attention of everyone's favorite star cop, Captain Marvel. Remember, she only pops in for matters that are deemed really important for the universe's survival. Child with infinite powers? Yeah, it feels like it could be a biggie. This ultimately leads to another civil war with Captain Marvel and Thor duking it out over the Child of Eternity in Phase 5 or 6. I mean, there's already a whole episode of What If dedicated to how much fun a Captain Marvel vs. Thor matchup would be. The writing is on the wall, people. That said, there is one final route that all of this could go. One that, uh, well, I noticed a few details that set off some alarms. It is a wild stretch, but, uh, you'll see. One other famous special power child storyline is the much older Celestial Madonna saga from the 1970s. This was written by Steve Englehart, whose work inspired a lot of WandaVision and Falcon and the Winter Soldier. Here's the abridged version, and I swear to you, I, I swear I am not making a single word of this up. Mantis, from the Guardians of the Galaxy, marries the ghost of an alien tree, who's reanimated the body of the recently deceased Avenger Swordsman, aka Jack the Sword Guy that we saw in the recent Hawkeye show. This somehow makes Mantis the prophesied Celestial Madonna, and her child with Tree Ghost Swordman is the Celestial Messiah. Seems like a story that's best left forgotten with the 70s, right? Well, Marvel disagrees. The Celestial Messiah is an eco-warrior that just recently returned in a central role of the 2020 event series Empire. Now, this story was insane. Honestly, I wouldn't have even brought it up if it weren't for one thing. It is one of the definitive Kang the Conqueror storylines. Character Marvel is clearly setting up to be their next Thanos. The Celestial Madonna Saga introduced a lot of his mythology. It even featured one of the first major instances of two Kang variants fighting, with the Conqueror facing off against Rama Tut, a version of Kang who was a pharaoh in ancient Egypt. Now, all of this seems completely random, but Rama Tut has already been referenced in Moon Knight with some Easter eggs. More importantly, though, they make it a point in Love and Thunder to remind us that Love's weapon of choice, Stormbreaker, has a handle that's made from Groot's arm. And that arm is still alive, sentient, and evidently growing. When planted in the ground, it takes root. Who knows? Maybe that whole alien tree messiah stuff could be on the table here, too, with Love becoming the Celestial Madonna and Stormbreaker growing into the character that's trying to woo her. Sounds insane! And admittedly, it is. But, I mean, they're giving Wonder Man a show for crying out loud. Did you even know that there was a character called Wonder Man? Because I didn't. So, there you have it, loyal theorists. The two new characters introduced to Love and Thunder that are gonna massively shake up the MCU moving forward. What's most exciting about this 
one is that they built the biggest story turn of the movie and now easily the biggest new character turn for the Thor franchise moving forward around a totally new story direction that was crafted specifically for the movies. Not taken from an existing comic, not taken from mythology, a new idea by the filmmakers. That is a huge deal. That the MCU, of all things, could become the next place we start seeing as a source for new characters and stories instead of just bigger budget movie length versions of old ones. That is something that we could have never predicted. But hey, one of the things I loved most about Thor Love and Thunder was its amazing aesthetics. It was colorful, bright, and most of all, it was fun. It's the sort of movie that just makes you want to grab its poster and hang it up in your house. And luckily, with today's sponsored Disc Plate, you can do exactly that. Disc Plates aren't just some paper posters that you pin up with thumbtacks. No, these are high quality prints on metal sheets, so they won't easily break or tear if you're moving, or just decide that you want to change up the art in your room. Each Disc Plate is mounted with magnets, so they're super easy to hang and you won't have to worry about damaging your walls. It also means that changing out designs, super easy. You just take one Disc Plate off the magnet and replace it with a new one. Did Star Wars suddenly become cringe to you and now you want to change up your aesthetic to some One Piece? You can do that without having to rehang a bunch of stuff or worry about your walls. I wanted to keep my walls recent, so I switched up my Loki Disc Plates for Thor. It took literally 30 seconds and instantly it made my room feel fresh again. Disc Plate has millions of designs available, with official art licensed from your favorite franchises. Do you like comics or the MCU? They have thousands of designs from both Marvel and DC. More a fan of film and TV? Disc Plate's got you covered with artwork from Star Wars, The Witcher, and Stranger Things. Really in the gaming? They've got more than enough of that one too. If any of this has caught your attention, click the link down in the description to get 25% off any one to two Disc Plates, or 29% off three or more. Thankfully, there's no code. No whatever. The discount's just gonna be automatically applied at checkout if you click the link, but the deal is only for a limited time, so go check them out if you want some awesome art printed on metal that'll last you a lifetime. Again, that is one to two disc plates for 25% off or three or more for 29% off just by clicking the link down in the description. And as always, my friends, remember, it's just a theory. A film theory. And cut.